Good afternoon. We're here today filming for the Hamilton Jazz Archive. We have a marvelous concert in store for us at the college this weekend, and part of that is cornetist Warren Vache. Welcome to Hamilton. Thank you. Nice to be here. I just flew in from New York on a little biplane and... Boy, my arm's made, tired. Yeah, your arms mm -hmm. are tired. And uh, you're a New York area, New Jerseyite. I was born in New Jersey. I now live in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. most of my life I've kept a residence in that area, yeah. sure. Was being in that area part of uh, important for your musical upbringing, do you think? I think it was in, in the sense that um, when I was a kid, it didn't make much difference. But as I started to go to college and began working, uh, I had my first gig at 15. And there was quite a lot of activity around Manhattan and New Jersey and Long Island back then. So it meant that uh, I worked almost every weekend of my life from the time I was 15 until now. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't do a lot of club hopping when I was a kid. I lived too far away from, yeah. from Manhattan to go in and see that. Um, but later on, I was fortunate enough to just catch the end of the club. Um, Heyday. The club yeah. scene, yeah. I mean, I worked at Condon's for four years mm -hmm. alongside Vic Dickinson. And two, two or three doors down the street was Jimmy Ryan's and Roy mm -hmm. Eldridge was there every night. Yeah. So uh, I was very fortunate to catch that. And that didn't happen almost any, anywhere else in the, right. in the world, you know. The, uh, a lot of the fellows we've been talking to who, who play swing or classic jazz, whatever we want to call it, we may talk about that. What do we want to call it? I, it's, I was going to ask you, and we had, uh, we were talking earlier with, with Ralph Sutton, and he, he refused to call it anything. And I don't know what to call it because it's a, uh, I mean, swing is a, is a big term, it can mean the big bands, but it's also a style of playing. Uh, no. Do you have any thoughts on, on the kind of music that, that you like to play? I think it's part of the problem we have in selling it is that we don't have something we can call it. It's not something that's easily tagged. Yeah. You know, you, do, you draw from so many different, different inspirations and sources that uh, it's difficult to say I play one particular thing. Uh, that means, it means it's hard to sell, it's hard for people who don't know what it is to uh, associate something. You know, you say swing means something different to you than it means to the guy that's pumping your gasoline. Right. right. You know? Um, we don't have any specific term that really relates to anything specific because the music is this huge thing that encompasses almost all styles and influences. Yeah. And it's, it's changed pretty quickly in the, in the space of 100 years, too, from... Very rapidly. From New Orleans to what we have now. And it, it's interesting that you can still hear almost every phase of jazz being played live somewhere. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite expressions is modern jazz is 40 years old, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, these things, though, these labels don't make much sense to me, and I'm sure they don't make much sense to the guy on the street who knows nothing about it. I don't know whether they help or hinder. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at this point leaning more toward hindrance. Mm -hmm. Well, when you were in, in your teens, the, the rock thing was, was happening, right? Oh, yeah. And what led you into, into this thing? Was it just by virtue of the fact that you played the, the cornet or the trumpet that you, or did you come from a musical? I came from a musical family. Dad was a, uh, um, a bass player and a part-time musician who always worked doing casual jobs, what we used to call club dates. Yeah. Um, weddings, that sort of thing. He had a large record collection and played records. One of my fondest memories as a kid is being able to wake up and lay in bed and listen to music for an yeah. hour. You know, it just was there. It was always around me. Mm -hmm. And Dad had a magnificent collection of 78s, which he didn't mind, you know, an eight or a nine-year-old yeah. going through and playing for yeah. himself. So these things were interesting, and I was interested in it. Um, the reason I never really gravitated toward rock and roll um, was in part a snobbishness on my part because I didn't think it as interesting mm -hmm. as the stuff I was listening to. Um, also, in part, it was not as interesting. I mean, I still can't take the Beach Boys as seriously as I can take uh, Louis Armstrong, uh -huh. you know, or uh, for that matter, even Ray Noble guys that were serious musicians. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of deep intent and thought put into music, and I didn't find that in rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, 
one of your first um, big moments, is, I, this is something I read, and I don't know if it's true. You, got, you did a, a concert with the New York Jazz Repertory, and you were doing some Bix tunes. Or yeah, that was, the, that was the first concert I, I, really, I really did in New York. It was for the New York Jazz mm -hmm. Repertory Company. And uh, it was the music of Big Spider Beck, and thanks to Bucky Pizzarelli and Kenny Deverne and some very timely recommendations, I was cast as Bix for a day. Mm -hmm. Did you do a lot of listening before that? Or well, was I'd, it always already part of you? No, I'd already, I mean, I'd yeah. been listening to, you know, those Spider Beck recordings mm -hmm. since I was a kid. Um, I knew most of the stuff from having played it millions of times, just as I knew a lot of Louis Armstrong solos yeah. from having played it a hundred and... And you're a little kid with a trumpet and you hear somebody do something like West End Blues. It's still pretty astounding. Yeah. Even now, played the trumpet for 40 years, every time I hear West End Blues, I think it's astounding. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was, I mean, I was prepared that way. And then, of course, Bob Wilbur or somebody had done note-for-note -note transcriptions. Yeah. So it was... Uh, not a question of having to transcribe it myself, but rather mm -hmm. just interpret. He was an interesting character, I guess, from Bix, what yeah. I've read. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about that series of concert was, was that they had everybody that was still alive from the Goldcat Band involved in that concert at one time or other. So uh, uh, while I never met Bix, I hung out with Joe Venuti. I hung out with Doc Riker, who was the lead alto saxophone. Chauncey Morehouse, the drummer, was still alive. Mm -hmm. Spiegel Wilcox, who may, who may be here tomorrow, is still alive, living in Cincinnati, New York. You ought to go over and see him. My goodness. Thanks for that information. Oh, he's just, he's a pistol, too. Mm. He's just absolutely as bright as a tack. And uh, he was in the Goldcat Band with all of mm. those guys. But everybody that was, that had anything to do with the Goldcat Band was at one point or other part of that series of concerts. Yeah. And I've always, uh, I have a sense of history that, gives me a great deal of pleasure when I get to meet and interact with people that have, you know, experienced something. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's been that like that read, for us. Yeah, that I've only read about. You know, it's astounding. <laughs> right. And this, I mean, my experience in the, in, in the music business has been full of those things. Mm -hmm. Where else could a, you know, a 19-year-old C student from New Jersey sit, sit next to alongside Vic Dickinson and take a yeah. master class for four years? Yeah. That's the, the great, that's the, probably the most effective way of learning, is absorbing that on the spot. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was, there was Vic to work with, and uh, I'd wait until about 11 o'clock, because it took Roy just about that long to warm up. <laughs> and then I'd walk into Ryan's and buy a beer, and Roy had the most competitive, wonderful nature of anyone I'd ever met. Any other trumpet player was a, a call two arms. <laughs> so he'd look down the bar and see the competition in there. Uh -huh. And the roof would go off the joint. And I mean, I get to watch, you get, not only do you get to listen to Roy play, playing is one thing. You get to watch the way guys lead the band, the way they interact with the people, mm -hmm. the way they run the room, because that's essentially what you're doing. You yeah. know, you can't, I never did think that you could stand up on the stage with your eyes closed and yeah. really fully communicate with mm -hmm. people. And in that situation, Roy was absolutely magnificent. You know, he just had everybody engaged and uh -huh. kept them that way and entertained the hell out of them. He couldn't resist a challenge, I guess. Well, he, I mean, he used to make that, but that was, there's another thing that, uh, another thing I'd like to address is, I mean, Roy was always, always up for a challenge, always would put you in the situation of a challenge. And somehow, when he beat you, you never felt put down. It was an honor. Mm. A quick story is one night, I think we got done at Condon's early. Might have been about 1 o'clock in the morning. And I was across the street getting into my car to go home. And I see Roy coming out of Ryan's, running across the street. He said, where are you going? And I said, well, they let us out early. I'm going to go home. He says, oh, man. You got to come help me on the last set. And I thought, geez, Roy Eldridge is asking <laughs> yeah. me to come help. Sure, I'll be there. Must have had a neon sign on my forehead that said "sucker." <laughs> I walked into the club. He bought me a drink. We went up to play the last set. Roy calls a tune. 
we play the first chorus, and he points at me to take the first solo. Mm -hmm. So I played a couple of choruses. Yeah. And he looked at me with a twinkle in his eye, <laughs> said, came to get me, huh? Picked the trumpet up in his left hand, played five choruses, no note under high C. Oh, Lord. His right hand in the jacket pocket, swinging it back and forth on two and four. <laughs> <laughs> shot me, dug the hole, put me in the box, <laughs> put the box in the ground, stomped on the dirt, looked at me and smiled. <laughs> and I walked out of there feeling absolutely wonderful. I'd had a lesson. You know? I mean, I couldn't get mad at this guy. Are you kidding? It was a magnificent thing to be. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of the feeling I get from um, the contemporary crop of musicians is more, more competitive and less comradely mm -hmm. than that. You know, I mean, yeah. if, I, if you told me tomorrow that Roy Eldridge would do the same thing to me, I'd be there waiting <laughs> in line, you know? <laughs> it was magnificent. That's great. Uh, the stories I've read about that kind of thing in Kansas City and that, that all-night jam session, you know, it, such a great learning experience, and I don't know if it's still happening these well, days. I don't, well, there's a lot, there was a lot of competition, but I think it was a little less intense. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot more camaraderie. Yeah. Tell us how you moved uh, out of the, or more onto national scene from, from New York area. And did you well, have was, a couple big breaks along the way, or was it a gradual? I was just very fortunate in being uh, in the right place at the right time in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. Right after the uh, the Big Spider Beck concerts, um, Benny Goodman was looking for a trumpet player, and again Bucky Pizzarelli recommended me, John Bunch recommended me, and uh, the next thing I knew, I found myself on a plane going somewhere in New Hampshire to play with Benny Goodman. Uh -huh. No rehearsal, no nothing. With small group. I was out working on my car. <laughs> I was draining the oil from my little Fiat. My old man comes out and says, "It's the phone for you." And I went in, I said, hello, and the voice said, this is Benny. And of course, I said, Benny who? <laughs> I couldn't believe it was Benny Goodman, but Benny Goodman called me personally. Bang, I was up there. And for the next 10 years or so, on and off, Amazing. I worked with Benny Goodman off and on in uh, varying combinations. Mm -hmm. Great. It was interesting. Yeah. It was also scarier than hell. Yeah, you that's know? what most people say. I went through a lot of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> it was a scary period, you know, because I really didn't, I knew I didn't have the, all the knowledge and all the confidence necessary to be in that level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you turn around, I was, what, 21, 22, and there was, uh, I mean, Hank Jones is playing piano, Slam Stewart's playing bass, Connie Kaye's playing drums, mm. Zoot Sims, Irby Green, Benny Goodman, and me. <laughs> Oy. And he had, had he heard you play at that point? No, Maybe I don't believe record. so. Took the, the I don't believe it. No, I hadn't recorded. Up to that point, I don't think I'd made a recording. Hmm. Uh, he just simply took Bucky's recommendation. And uh, just kept me on for about 10 years. Wow. Plus, I had to be a pretty quick study. Yeah. But again, there was no music. This was I was just going to ask. It's just nothing that was... The kind of arrangements we did with the small band um, were pretty much made up on the spot. And uh, what note you had pretty much depended on who was the other side band for that, uh -huh. that week. Uh, that's one of the experiences that I had growing up that kids don't get nowadays. Um, even the club date bands that I started to play with when I was in high school and college. I mean, there were guys around New York that would hire you for a... Uh, Oh, a society wedding or a dance at the Westchester Country Club. And you'd show up and there'd be three saxophones, two trumpets and a trombone, and three rhythm. And these guys would eat songs. They'd get a tempo and play a dance medley that lasted 20 minutes. Mm. No more than one chorus of any tune. Medleys. 20 minutes of medleys. Not only did they play all those, I mean, they eat up 500 tunes a set. Oh. And they would play it in three-part and six-part harmony. Mm. The, the melody would bounce back and forth between the brass and the saxophones, all with little hand signals that went on. 
That's and you had to use your ear. You had to sit there, and if the first trumpet was playing the lead, mm -hmm. the trombone had the fifth, you had to play the third. I mean, there was a first, an understood first mm -hmm. and second and third part harmony. And you learn a lot having to think on your feet. Yeah. Not only do you learn the tunes, you learn the harmony, you learn to sort of intuit where the change is going to go. I mean, that was a wonderful training ground. Right, and it's really hard to teach that in a classroom. I don't think it can be done. Yeah, it, I don't think it can be done because the immediacy that not having time to think. Now, I got to tell you, there's an awful lot of bad notes that go by, too. You mm -hmm. know? But you learn that uh, bad notes are not always the worst thing in the world, mm -hmm. as, as long as you, you keep your eye on the intent. Yeah. And play them in time. <laughs> play them in time and correct it the next time it comes yeah. along. You know? Right. But uh, I mean, that was a. So that's essentially what I had to do with Benny, except that the rhythm sections were better and the band swung more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Did you get to go overseas with him? Yeah, I did my first uh, overseas trip in 1974 mm -hmm. with Benny and uh, John Bunch. Bucky Pizzarelli, Barrett Deems, and uh, I think Irby was on that one. Peter Rapley, Art on Vibes. Tell us about your uh, association with Scott Hamilton and how that came about. Well, I was working at Condon's at the time, and the fellow that worked the door and sort of managed the place used to run the half note. Mike Cantorino was mm -hmm. his name. And Mike was running. The, uh, the Condon band worked. Mm, Tuesday through Saturday and uh, on Sundays Mike would book another band and Mike had heard Scott play with uh, Hank Jones over at Michael's Pub and thought it would be a good idea since we were more or less the same age yeah. to put us together for a Sunday night there which is where I met him and we've just uh, it's a good match huh? just continued a relationship for yeah. a long time yeah, yeah. Um, you guys are playing a, a kind of music we, we mentioned earlier that, that we don't, I don't know what to call it, but, but it comes from a time that was uh, before your formative years, I guess, and what's the most modern type situation you've ever found yourself in? Is that a, is that a, a fair term or contemporary or... What are you talking? I don't see. I don't. I don't necessarily. I can intuit what I think you mean. Yeah, I guess I'm talking about if have you found yourself in situations with electronic instruments? Yeah, where, sure. And and you, you, do you like those more? Is it just something different? Is it? Uh, is it My problem with electronic instruments is that they have one color, and that's the color you're stuck with. Mm -hmm. You know, the the player really has very little, aside from flipping switches and. Uh, adjusting sliders, there's no, nothing you can do physically touching the instrument mm -hmm. to make the sound different. I mean, the synthesizer is going to make Dave McKenna sound like <laughs> everybody else that touches a synthesizer. Yeah. Whereas you put him at a piano, it can only be Dave McKenna. So there's a little more richness for me in, in Dave's personality. Right. Uh, electronic instruments seem to, for me, they seem to... Um, Handicap personal expression. Now, when you're playing over them, sometimes it can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Because, I mean, synth strings are nice and warm and they're cheap. <laughs> you know, and it's nice to play over. Yeah. yeah. That, that sort of cushion. Right. Um, if you're talking about um, different harmonic situations, well, one of the things about uh, the music I play generally and uh, have a great love for is that it's pretty standard um, harmonies. We don't, you know, it's not necessarily modal. It's two fives, yeah, and uh, melodies, and uh, there are different different sorts of harmonic. The modal school, all the rest. Of it. I've played with that, but I don't sort of find that again. It's a matter of expression. I think there's a great, a greater breadth of emotion to be expressed in, in chromatic harmony than there is in modal harmony. Mm -hmm. Modal is yet, it's different, you don't, you don't get that in chromatic harmony, it is different, but I don't find the same subtlety 
within the framework that I do in chromatic music. Mm -hmm. you know? I've yet, to see, I've yet to hear a modal piece of music that had the same sort of richness of color as a Brahms symphony. Mm -hmm. Or for that matter, a nice Clifford Brown solo. Yeah. You know? It it's, pulls me in many directions. It seems like sometimes with a, with a modal based music too, it, they seem to spend longer on, on each change perhaps. And I don't know if sometimes that's a good thing. <sighs> All, all I know is I went in, I had some trouble with my back, and I went to a chiropractor one time. Yeah. I'm laying on this table while he's got these electrodes stimulating a muscle or something, charging me too much money. And he's got a radio station on, and it's this new age stuff. And I spent a half an hour lying on that table listening to the Lydian mode in F. <laughs> there must have been about 15 selections, and they were all in the goddamn Lydian mode in F. <laughs> By the time I got back, I said, are you trying to relax my muscles or give me a lobotomy? <laughs> Change the station. It's just, I mean, I don't know, I understand. It's like, it's just, bleh. This thing that says, yeah. okay, I'm calm, I'm relaxed, yeah. I'm hip. <laughs> now can I feel something? It's, that's exactly what happens, you know. When yeah. you, and it's, um, I'd much rather listen to Louis Armstrong mm -hmm. playing ski that de that. What led you, well, I'm going to turn back the clock a little bit, what led you to uh, stick with the, the cornet? Was there any special reason for that? Yeah, well, so the other part of what, um, what I got from being around guys like Roy and Vic was that uh, controlling your instrument and learning to play it well are only the beginning phase of being a musician. Um, the sound that instrument makes has to become your voice. As natural as when you speak or sing. And just as, as idiomatic as a singing or speaking voice is, that's what your sound on the instrument is allowed to become in, in jazz. So the reason I play the cornet is because that's what I hear. That is my voice. I've had 150 trumpets in my hand. They never feel as comfortable as a cornet does. Now, I'm admittedly not looking to get work in studios where I'm going to make the sound the producer wants to hear. Yeah. When you make this choice, you actually limit the sort, of, the sort of work you can take. I'm not going to go out and audition for the, the Hamilton College Symphony mm -hmm. because the sound I make is going to be unacceptable in that situation. Right. But so you make that decision. and, and Part of, the wonder, part, of the, part of the magic of jazz for me is that so much of a player's personality is expressed mm -hmm. in that sound. You hear Vic Dickinson, there's never going to be another person in the world that's going to make that sound truly and completely unique. I can hear two bars of Roy Eldridge and tell you who it is. I mean, this is the sort of thing that really fascinated me. And I think that... Um, my life is just the constant search to find where I am in relation to what I've learned, what mm -hmm. I know, where I've worked, to find that voice, that, that character that makes me unique. Well, you really echo the, the sentiments of some of the other fellows we've talked to, uh, Al Gray and Sweets Edison. They, they, they said the same thing. You talked thing to Sweets Edison? Yes. Did you get enough that you didn't have to edit? Yeah. No, he's the funniest man in the world. He's great. Oh, I and have to uh, send him $65 a month, you know, because I steal so much of his <laughs> stuff. <laughs> he said the same thing. He said that he doesn't hear, well, he didn't, he wasn't complaining. He said that today he doesn't hear that striving for, for sound as much as is when he was coming on, and that, that that was a big part of everyone's goal. Yeah. Was to... Indiv strain for individuality, yeah. you know. Now everybody has a lovely, schooled, technical, marvelous approach, and I can't distinguish one of them from another. Mm -hmm. You got three notes of Sweets, and I mean, Sweets Edison invented himself. He's one of the, one of the prime characters in America, and always has been. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's funny, it's, you know, I just, I did, where, where the hell was I? I did some jazz party, and they put a bunch of trumpet players on the stand, and Sweets was with us, you know. And we're all up there sweating and popping veins and doing our level best to impress everybody, and Sweets goes up and goes, boop, 
<laughs> and the audience melts. It's like shooting fish in a barrel for him. You know, he, does, he doesn't even have to touch it. He's just so unique that, I mean, that's the sort of thing yeah. that really, one of these days I'll get there. That's what I'm working for, you know? Well, wow. how has uh, the music scene changed for you, or has it since, since you started? Is it, is it uh, you know, for our aspiring jazz musicians, well, is it, is it uh, getting tougher? Yeah, I feel very sorry for anybody that really wants to start it now. It's, uh, what's gone are all the, what's not, not necessarily gone, I'm starting to sound like my father, for heaven's sake. What's, what's not the same is that there are fewer and fewer places to play and earn while you learn. Those club dates that I did, um, all the little clubs that I used to go and work on a Saturday night, the places I used to go sit in, uh, they're gone. They're not, I mean, it's not to say they won't come back at some mm -hmm. point, but that whole, there used to be so much to do. I could work three or four times a week mm -hmm. uh, in New York doing receptions for companies. They all had a live band. Now you get one guy with a synthesizer and a singer, mm -hmm. you know? Or a DJ. Or a DJ. Yeah. And that's, uh, that part of it's gone. There's a lot of bread and butter work that isn't there anymore. Yeah. And that means that uh, all that's happened is that the, the uh, it's been polarized. You're either making a lot of money or you've got a day job and you do it for fun. Because economically, there's, it's a struggle to stay just in the middle. Mm -hmm. to just make a living. Now there's less studio work because the electronics have taken over. You laughed when I said strings are, uh, the synth is cheaper, yeah. but I know. a major yeah. impact on what we do, sit down with a pencil sometime right. when you're watching television at night and let, the, let those commercials go by. Just make a tick every time you hear electronic background and a tick every time you hear right. Um, um, real live music background, and you're going to find uh, the electronics is getting a lot of the work. Oh yeah, even in the pit bands for the touring Broadway shows I've seen, you know, now they've got six or seven people in the pit and they're playing, you know, yep. the string section is now a, a keyboard man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is something, well, I mean, change. something you can't, so it's a, that's a question of taste too. This is an art, and we sell it to people, and as a result, it's, uh, we're at the mercy of public taste. Whichever way it goes, and you can blame marketers for influencing mm -hmm. public taste or not. Sometimes you're in the right spot at the right time, and mm -hmm. sometimes you're not. Yeah. You know, I don't know quite uh, if anyone has any control over that. Well, we don't want to get too uh, down. Let's uh, tell me about the one of the greatest gigs you ever had, or is it maybe tonight? Uh, the next one. <laughs> the yeah. next one. The next one. I think uh, it, all in all for me, I mean, the most exciting time of my life was Condens. And being next to, you know, I mean, there's thousands of people used to come hang at that bar. It was a party every night. And most of the musicians that I'd heard about, read about, respected, and many that I didn't know came in. And it was the time of my life where I actually met all of my heroes. and in a working capacity. Yeah. It was a marvelous time. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, looking back on it now, it was one yeah. hell of a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us what, uh, what a typical uh, month for you is like now, when you you're a lot of traveling, I would imagine, to, to, yeah. to get, I mean, there's probably not that many engagements right where you live. Is I don't think I've worked in New York in the last six years. Wow. So know, it's a, I'm on the road six to eight months a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a lot of traveling, a lot of flying. Um, a typical month is uh, basically spending a lot of time on the telephone, trying to fill in holes in the calendar for the next month. Yeah. And uh, I don't very often get to control who I play with. So, but I. I just, after, through these years, I've developed a system of very dear friends 
I don't have an agent, so these friends will. I was going to ask, you handle most of your own business. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for somebody. But yeah. It's one of those catch-22 situations where uh, you don't make enough money to, to without an agent to warrant an agent. Right. You know, it's, I just, I'm going to crack that wall one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> but I managed to, I mean, so far I've managed to make a fairly decent living, and I do what I like to do. Mm -hmm. So there are certain... You know, I won't be driving the Cadillac this year. Uh -huh. I won't be retiring at age 50, but I get to do what I like. Yeah. Uh, Ralph Sutton has an attitude that's, that's, that's quite like that, and he just seems to say, I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. And I said, gee, that's nice. <laughs> well, Ralph is in a situation and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a part of a stage in his life where he can say that. Yeah. Now, I'm supporting a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old, mm -hmm. an ex-wife, and myself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, much as I would like to say I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do, very often the reality is, right. get me something to do. Right. <laughs> you know? It's uh, interesting to go to these uh, jazz parties and, and cruises and so forth. That, you, Like you said, you don't have much control over who you're going to play with. And the idea of, of having a repertory of tunes in your head, I think is imposing to, to uh, students who think about, you know, the, well, I, gonna, I know the real book, or, you know, I, I know every sixth page of the real book or something, but you really have to have a, 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 a pretty vast song list in your head, I would think. You've got to be able to think on your feet very quickly. Yeah. I mean, I t I'll take a tour in England. I don't know who I'm going to work with. And I could end up playing somewhere in the middle of the country with a pianist I've never seen before who only knows, I've got to be able to look at this guy and figure out what he's going to know. And if I call a tune that he doesn't know, I have to have another one immediately ready because mm -hmm. I'm entertaining a room full of people. I yeah. have to do this with a guy I've never met before. You have to find a way to keep everybody engaged and this guy engaged. <laughs> and it's, sometimes it, can, it gets pretty tough. Yeah. But you develop chops for it. Mm -hmm. That's right, chops in your yeah, mental chops you just as have well as. To walk on the stage prepared to think on your feet. Mm -hmm. And if that involves playing Watermelon Man all night long, that's what you're going to have to do, you know? <laughs> you may not be happy about it, but it's got to be done. <laughs> wow. Who are the guys, uh, who's your dream band? Can oh. I tell you about that? Can I, can you, no. No? Too many guys? It's just too many, yeah. yeah. God, I, I mean, I love so many people. Have you worked behind uh, some notable singers? Well, Rosemary years? Clooney. Scott yeah. and I did Rosemary Clooney for a number of years. Yeah. I just did a record with Bobby Short mm -hmm. and a double album with Benny Carter that uh, is the Benny Carter songbook and has, uh, oh, I would think anywhere from 12 to 13 singers on it. Oh. Everyone did two or three tracks apiece or one track apiece. Mm -hmm. Everybody from Shirley Horn to Joe Williams to... Yeah. Uh, Interesting. If you had one word of advice for uh, <laughs> our aspiring musicians, how to practice. Spend, spend half your time practicing something. Is there something you could fill in there? That well, way? let's see. From the point of view of practicing, as a trumpet player, we're all concerned with endurance, because it hurts to play the instrument. Um, what I did was, when it started to hurt, I put the horn down. So instead of practicing an hour and a half at a clip, I may do, I may do 30 minutes three times a day, or 15 minutes six times a day. But if it starts to hurt, stop, because you're practicing it feeling bad. <laughs> you might as well practice yeah. while it feels good. Yeah. You know, if your lip isn't yeah. working, don't struggle. Mm -hmm. Put it back down. Um, the other one is an amazing amount of practice uh, for me. This is not, um, not the physicality of the instrument, but amazing amount of practice for me. Happens all day long. I'm always thinking about music. At this point in my life, every time I hear a tone, I've got fingers going down. Because wow. that's what I, I mean, that's what I've done naturally, uh -huh. you know? So there's a, as a, 
a larger sort of practicing, if you're really committed to music, every time you hear a piece of music, there's a certain amount of analysis that gets done. Mm -hmm. For instance, if something moves you in, uh, um, on something you've heard on the radio, can you analyze what the voicing was that moved you? Mm -hmm. Can you analyze what, the, you know, do you know what the chord was? If you don't have perfect pitch, can't, do you sit there and try and figure out, well, that's an A minor 7 and the 7's in the bass, and mm -hmm. that's why it's that movement that I like. Yeah. And you remember that and use it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, this is the great, vast, wonderful thing about music, is the more you know, the more you know, you don't know, you don't know. Right. And the more there is to find and hear. So in that sense, the practicing never stops. Right. Because just learning to play and make a sound on an instrument is not enough. That's not what it's about. It's about making music, and that involves thought, a lot of which is compulsive in me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always said that anybody that goes into music or to jazz, into jazz for a living does it because they're diseased. It's a compulsion. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, it's a disease. I can't, there's a voice in my head that keeps playing melodies. I can't stop it, much as I'd like to, uh -huh. sometimes. <laughs> I don't think there's any medication for that. I either. don't think so either. Think it's a disease. Stuck We're stuck. With it. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, looking forward to the concert tonight, and thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Oh, well, my pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. On behalf of the Hamilton Jazz Archive, I'd like to thank Warren Bachet for his time, and we'll see you tonight. Good. I'll go home and practice. <laughs> Fifteen minutes only. That's it. Okay. You got it. Okay.